Welcome to the New Judge One Podcast. My name is Isaac Kamins. This is a bi-weekly podcast where my friend Jess O'Brien and I discuss internal martial arts, qigong, and meditation. Uh, this week we continue our discussion of the Wu style Tai Chi uh, and the comparison of the Wu style with the Yang style. Um, and in this episode we go more into the history of the creation of the Wu style. Again from the... Uh, article with Bruce Francis from 1987. In our extended episode, we talk about the um, difference between the Wu Jinchuan style and the Wu Yushang style. So that's a long discussion. Um, Then we continue our discussion of uh, the Tai Chi classics and we're beginning the Song of the 13 Postures. So we give a little history of that. And uh, that... In, in that, it references the Ming Yi, which is a, a, effectively fate. So we get into a discussion of fate and karma and what that means in terms of Taoist meditation. Uh, so hope you enjoy that. Thanks for listening. Uh, we also have a Facebook group and uh, Instagram, all that stuff. So check that out. Uh, thanks for listening. Take care of yourselves and be well. In today's episode, we're going to go back to uh, talking about the Wu style of Taiji Chun. As well as uh, get started on when another chunk of the uh, Taiji classics that we've been looking at. We'll begin with a piece from A Comparative Look at the Wu Style by Kumar Francis from the Tai Chi Magazine, October 1987 issue. So he's here, he talks about the origin of the Wu Style. So we've talked about this before, but he, it's a little bit different each time we read about it. From the various different authors we've looked at you know, concerning the history of the Wu style. So he says, the Wu style was derived from the classical Yang style. The inventor of the Yang style, Yang Luchan, came to Beijing and taught the emperor's guards. He had three top students. Wang Chun was known for his development of hard energy, Ling Shan for his development of soft energy, and a third student was known for his development of transformational energy, Hua, the highest stage of soft energy. This disciple was a Manchurian named Chun Yu, and was considered to be Yang's best non-family member student. After the Manchu Qing dynasty fell, Chuan's son changed his name to Wu, a Han Chinese name. It is from this son, Wu Jianchuan, that the Wu style derives its name. However, this is not to be confused with the Wu style of Wu Yuxiang, a contemporary of Yang Luchan himself. Wu Yuxiang's style was also consists of small compact movements and is usually called the Hao style. It is now almost extinct. In person, all these years, you ever seen anybody do it? Yeah, uh, what's this? Oh, Albert Liu. Uh, Albert Liu's. The, uh, That's true. I guess you're right. Yeah, his Tai Chi. Well, he had a couple different steps, but he would start off with the Wu Yu Xiang. Yeah, I guess I. I saw them mostly doing the Liu Ho Ba Fa, but I do remember mm-hmm. they they did the Wu Yu Xiang Tai Chi. I think uh, isn't Sun Lu Dong style also is considered. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it, I think a lot of there there was kind of a a couple different like versions of that same form, right? So have different names essentially. So mm-hmm. some people co- still call it the Wu, Wu Yushang style. Some people call it the Hao style after Wu's student, um, which is essentially what became the he taught Sun Lu Dong. Right. So that's the same basic form as the Sun style of Tai Chi, right? So it's like those are all three of those are essentially the same form. Yeah. Because like I remember Tim Carmel would do the Sun style where their single whip, it's like it's like two palms. There isn't even really a whip to it. And it's like a very tall stance. Well, that's the picture of Albert in one of the, I think it's in um some mm. maybe in the you know, back of one of those where he you know he was the translator or something but yeah uh-huh. he, he does a he does a single whip that's too open it's the two open po- yeah so it's yeah. interesting sun lu dong or maybe it's wu yushang who came up with that right but well, that's, that's a whole that's where i'm sure it w- as it went from wu to how to sun there were some slight changes right. at each you know at each jump there's usually right. a little bit of a but I suppose if you ask them, they'd say, No, this is the way Yang Lu Chen and Wu Yu Shang used to do it. It was sure. it was the Yang family who changed it, you know. So yeah, it's like yeah, yeah. the mists of time make it almost impossible to tell. You know, it was a it was two versions of the same of the you know, quote unquote Yang style, mm-hmm. and one version became what 
you know, kept the name Yang right. style and the other right. version Wu Yushang took and right. to so it makes sense, right? Like if you're you and your buddy are both teaching and he, you know like two sets, you might not want to both teach the same set, right? Like right, right. It makes more, you know, makes sense that way. Yeah. The typical martial arts situation. So he continues the story here. So he says the Wu style continued a definite trend in Taiji Chen's development. The original Chen style tended to emphasize hard over soft internal energy with its explosive shaking techniques. After the hard energy was fully developed, the soft would be produced, the other half of the yin yang circle. Yang Lu Chan then took a new tack, essentially still having hard produce soft, but placing a stronger emphasis on simultaneously cultivating soft energy. His goal was to develop half hard energy and half soft energy right from the start. This was a major shift from the Chen and earned Yang the right to be called the creator of a new style. So that that's a little bit like what you were saying, like the circumstances and the vibe is changing. So he makes an innovation that now we're going to do half 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 hard. I like, I, I like beginning. that. I like the idea, though, that it's 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 percentages, right? It's mm. like it's still there. It's just how much you're going to put towards it, you know? Right. So you can pick and choose exactly what where you start from and in, in the goal of creating a balance of yin and yang. So he says, then Wu Jian Chuan shifted full circle from the original Chen, emphasizing the development of soft energy first and then from the soft producing the hard. Thus, the Wu style starts with yin energy, the yang style with half yin and half yang, and the Chen with yang energy. Hard and soft energy go a step beyond external movements and relaxation. These energies are developed through basic practice modes and techniques, which are different for each classical Taiji Chen style. So there you have it. It's, it's you know it's kind of simplified in 1987. This was kind of big news, kind of you know. This was he was one of the first people to sort of theorize this kind of thing in English. I'd say. Yeah, I mean, and just even having a discussion about the different styles was rare. I think at that point, I mean, brand new, man. Because you know, idea that you someone had experienced all three A was was kind of unheard of at the time, and B to have. Uh, a logical sense of why they developed which way and you know it's new yeah i mean there's much more nuanced theories if you will but i think that that one for the uninitiated who's reading a article in a magazine in 1987 that's a great sort of um again the percentages give you a, a sense of like Okay, it's like just like moving in a direction, you know, that So just to keep ripping through this article. So he says as one learns it in more depth, one sees that the Wu style entails extremely intricate, complicated, and subtle internal coordination. In the Wu style, large internal movements below the skin level are associated with very small external movements, which can be half, a fifth, or even a tenth of the size of typical Yang style movements. However, internally, the same amount of work has occurred within the body. So I, I like that because uh, Wu style is kind of confusing sometimes when you see a, someone demonstrating it, especially this uh, this BK Francis version where a lot of the movements are quite, there's not a lot of like fluid, like when I was learning the Chen Pan Ling style, there is a lot of like, you know, you reach forward and pull back with big weight shifts and stuff. And your your arms kind of swirl and coil quite a bit. Whereas the Wu style, you get a little bit less of the superfluous movement. It's very stripped down. The movements are extremely, you don't swing your arms a whole lot. Like they move slowly as your body moves. And it's definitely got a different look to it. And he describes that as having a, a much greater focus on internal body movement. Yeah, I mean, the thing he would always say is there's like, um, <clears throat> the more you do on the outside, the less you do on the inside, the more you do on the inside, the less you do on the outside, right? That that there's certain sort of, you know, you only have so much you can do, right? So it's like you have to kind of decide how much you're going to put towards what, you know? So you, it's just, again, it's this compare, right. it's this... Um, percentage thing where you're like okay i'm gonna put 
the percentage of what I'm doing towards either hard or soft, right? Or change, you know? True, so, yeah. So you so, can pick what you want to focus on. Each master picked a different perspective to build their thing around. Right. I mean, I think it's most likely it had to do with stages of life, you know, that when you're younger, you're going to yeah, that's true. Too. Um, do it harder. And, and then when you're as you get older it becomes more about you know softness and health and all that definitely there's a progression in your life so i guess when kumar says here that there's a lot going on under the skin level that reminds me of the beginning of the wu style form whether it's a short form or long form is this opening sequence every tai chi form has opening that's where your hands come up and your hands come down but the way he teaches it i've learned some different yang style forms and wu style of other types and it you kind of, everybody does that first move, but it's not a big deal. When Kumar teaches it, it's a very big deal. You do a ton of shit within that movement. You you recapitulate Pung, Liu, Ji, and An in just the up, you know, the, the rising of the hands and the falling of the hands contain very intricate way you're supposed to, where you hold your weight, at the wave of energy that moves through your body, then out through your hands as you do Pung. And then drawing it all back in and suctioning in your joints. And like, there's a lot to that first movement. And I think that really speaks to his version of the Wu style where he's not kidding when he says there's a ton of internal stuff you do that if someone was watching me do it, it would look like your average Tai Chi form pretty much. But there's some, there's underneath the skin, you're doing some pretty, you know, pretty intricate things. The, the, methodology can change essentially so you you can do it for example you can do it by bending straightening your joints so for example in some schools it's about you know i bend my wrist for pong i straighten my wrist for g i bend the other side of my wrist for you and then i stretch my wrist for for uh on uh, he does it with the opening and closings right so you you um combine the opening and closing and the bending and straightening so you have this idea that you bend your arm but open your joints for pung you stretch your arm and open your joints for g you bend your arm and close your oh, joints yeah. for the and you stretch your arm and close your joints for on and that's the most Com, quote unquote complete version right because it in court if you would also incorporate that up and uh up the back out the arms you're doing all of it, right i mean and there you are creating a microcosmic orbit at the same time too. It's uh, like, it's, yeah i mean exactly. it's like just like you would do in santi or just like in bagua circle walking well it, it's it, a, it's essentially what baiwa describes as the guion ne gong quote unquote right is essentially the, all the components that I just described of what you're going to do when you do a movement like the the commencement, right? Because it's like the whole purpose of that movement um, is to get those four energies to be clearly defined and yet separate, right? The next thing he puts here is that uh, as far as Tai Chi Chen technology is concerned, some things remain relatively constant. The Wu style emphasizes high stances, small compact movements. The initial development of softer healing energy, short distance fighting applications, and emptiness in pushing hands. The Wu style specialty, as passed down to me by Liu Hung Jae, is its ability to still the mind and heal injuries, especially spinal problems. That is because it focuses on soft rather than hard energy techniques, which can aggravate health problems. The Yang style emphasizes Fa Jin, discharging energy, with soft on the outside and hard or heavy on the inside utilizing both short and long range applications. Whereas the Chen style leans towards hard energy with a larger repertoire of martial techniques derived from many external Kung Fu systems done in an internal fashion. All three Taiji Chen styles share the same fundamental methods of opening and aligning the body, internal coordination, relaxation, stilling the mind, Qi development, internal power and self-defense. The methods and benefits described in this article pertain to the authentic classical Wu style and not necessarily to many of the watered down versions which exist. But yeah, I think it's from what he says at the beginning there, he says Leo Hung Jay specialized in stilling the mind and healing injuries. All Tai Chi requires that you be able to quiet your mind and mm. relax your body. 
It's it's how you're going to when you start doing something, how you're going to express it. Right. The way I put it in my head, because it was uh, more the Neja Chuan model of you had Tai Chi as the soft, Shingy was mm. the hard and Bagua was the change. Mm. Well, you have that same dynamic within Tai Chi, right? You have right. soft, hard and change. And those were right. those. Those were those first three students of of Yang Luchan, right? Each right. one kind of had a different one of those different aspects. So, just to wrap up this article, um, I'll just before we move on to the uh, Taiji Chen classics, I'll just read the last little bit he says here. The classical Wu, Yang, and Chen styles all have their own particular specialties and limitations, and all have equal potential for self defense. To say one style is a simplified version of the other, or that one style is the improvement of the other. It's something rarely done by people of high kung fu ability who have realized the ne gong internal power of the tai, of any tai chi chen style. In China, people who have reached this level usually look at the personal gong fu of the individual practitioner, not the style. Those who have gone through all the hard work it takes to achieve ne gong will generally respect others who have attained a high level of kung fu, regardless of which tai chi chen they practice. All right, so now we're going to jump over to Bai Hua's book, where we've looked at. The first two classics of the Taiji Chen classics that he that he lists of his four. Now we're yeah. going to look at the third book. Um, so the Song of Thirteen Postures is an interesting piece of the Taiji Chen classics literature. I was going to start off by looking at Barbara Davis's book, the Taiji Chen Classics, where she uh, gives a little historical background that I thought would be good to start with. Um, so she says the Thirteen Postures song is the only formal composed poem in the classics. Its contents summarize in simple terms the main points of Taiji Chen practice. Whether it predates the essays of the classics is not clear. If it predates the other texts, it may have been a source from which the classics authors drew. If it postdated the other texts, it serves as a poetic summary of the major concepts. So I thought that was interesting, the idea that this is the only one that's written in a truly formal Chinese poem sense, um, and the other ones are more just, just sort of loosely contained essays. So this must have been written by someone literary, someone with writing skill and ability. So like, did the other books come from this one or does this one re recapitulate and summarize the other books remains unclear? Right. And in some versions, this comes in the middle. This mm. comes at the end. Others mm -hmm. put it at the beginning. I mean, it's like, who right. knows? Baby? Right. And so this one's anonymous. There's no author ever listed with this. So that makes it interesting. She says, the 13 posture song is composed of six four-line stanzas of seven words per line. This poetic format is common in Chinese poetry and ditties. For students, this was a means by which Taiji Chen principles could easily be committed to memory. The cadence is similar to many English poems and nursery rhymes, like Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. So the set, each of the seven word lines has a rhyme to it that allows right. you to memorize it well and that reminds me a little bit of it's like the the it's the same sort of structure as the 100 character tablet i mean it's, mm. you know, it's using and you know, the 36 songs of Bogdan right, right. also they all yeah. use that sort of poemy form barbara says this too some of the lines of the poem are difficult to interpret let alone translate there are numerous variant characters among editions of the poem most are homophonic substitutions, most likely the result of transcription errors. But the author of the poem occasionally used filler material to complete the demands of the rhyme or rhyme scheme. For example, O oh, sing, O oh, sing. So the author sometimes sticks in words just to keep the, right. the rhythm flowing. Um, so that's what Barbara says to start off with. So I guess this one's one of the most mysterious of the Taiji Chen classics. And... Uh, in some ways, it's the most distinct of the classics. It's the shortest piece, except for the Pushing Hands one that a lot of books contain. So now let's look at it from Bai Hua's perspective. He's, he, he begins the first line of the, the Song of 13 Postures. Don't underestimate these 13 postures. The origin of the human's body's destiny is dominated by the waist. Um, so it's a short but pithy sentence that uh, is actually quite convoluted on some levels but it's clear that the waste itself is at the center the dante and the waste this is the where where everything's taking place if everything from the 13 postures to your your life destiny your supreme destiny so and everything in between are all rooted in or dominated by or controlled by or or originate in 
the Dantian is my impression of what Bywa is trying to say. Yeah, I mean, it's basically the idea that in the world, there's the the Tao. Inside of you, there's the Dantian, right? So the the center, if you will, right? The the oneness is in in your Dantian. So all of this stuff we've been going through is about creating this connection through your your Zhong Ding into your Dantian, right? So well, that's yeah, that's what Baihua says in his explanatory sense, right? About- so, so that's the simple part of it is like your movement is controlled by your waist. But there's also this sort of double meaning here where, Mm -hmm. you know, your your Ming Yi is your, like, it's your fate, it's your karma, it's your sort of everythingness, right? So it's not just your physical movements that's controlled by this thing. It's all of it, right? It's all Mm Nadon. So maybe that's by that. Don't underestimate it. Like, it's not a small thing. Like, this Dantian connection is... Not just for fighting in martial arts, but it's this greater movement in life. It's, yeah, everything yeah, is drawn yeah. from there. I think. The, I think the you know the idea is don't overlook this this connection between your body and your destiny, if you will, your karma, right? Because the idea in all Taoist practices basically is that your body is the vehicle, right? Mm -hmm. for for doing the or it's the container for doing the practices and it's the vehicle to get you to the next stage right like so in your multiple lifetime or multiple incarnations as you go through from being a whatever to a human to whatever happens to your energy after that you know there's this something is continuous right This, this and that's the the oneness right that that you know, energy cannot be created or destroyed and uh, only transferred or transformed, right? Right, so we, that makes we, sense. When you die, your energy goes somewhere, right? I mean, I don't particularly think you come back as another person or a whole being or a flower or something. I mean, I think you probably get, you know, blasted into a bunch of little tiny bits and, you know, you might be like, you know, I don't know, whatever, but like you, your energy doesn't just go away. Like it, it, it does transform into something else. And so I think the idea is that what they're, you know, what they do in Taoist meditation is work on unifying that energy so that when you die, you scatter into fewer pieces. And if you unify it all and you go off as one piece, that's what's called a Taoist immortal, right? So like this idea of, of, as the Jing Chi Shen refine and refine and refine and refine, if you can get to the point where they become the one, then you, you know, you can go all the way, but that's like, you know, becoming a, you know, what are, what are you know, like fully enlightened being and all Insane. that. So, yeah. So Bio has two senses where he tries to explain what this, what this concept is about. So he says, according to the classics, it is said that the 13 postures of Tai Chi cannot be separated. They are all connected through the Zong Ding, or central equilibrium. The one is achieved by using the Dantian, or waste, as the origin of all your movement. So there you have it. There's the 13 postures are all one long flowing river. They're connected through the central equilibrium, through your central channel. And that the way to tap into that is to use the Dantian. That's the origin of all your movements. That's a that's sort of a formula that that recapitulates a lot of what's been said previously in the other classics. This is kind of a distillation. Maybe Barbara Davis is right, is that this poem is a a gathering of everything that's been said before and sort of condensing it kind of. Well, it either came before or after. I mean, right. who, you know, one so, or the other. <laughs> well, if it came after, it's a it's a condensing of all the other stuff. Right. And if it if it was you know pre-existed, then it was the egg the, kind of the the, the, the birth the, the rest the source material right i mean i personally think that this type of thing where it's a poem like this is they're pulling from other sources right so there's a some pre tai chi sources talking about this stuff right so there's a there's a taoist text somewhere that says something to the effect of you know your spirit is controlled by the the tao what the Tai Chi guys did is they took that Taoist phrase of 
you know, everything is connected to the Tao. And they said, all movement is connected to the Dandian because in your body, the center is your Dandian, right? So it's this whole like, uh, sort of substance. I can see that. Yeah. That's that poetry side of it. So the second sense is the more difficult one that Baiwa says here. So he talks about this concept, Ming Yi. Ming Yi can refer to the way in which the three inner combinations of Jing, Qi, Shen are all controlled by the Dantian. And then he says, in that same way, the Dantian is the source of the Yi itself. So it's, it's, uh, it's like this Ming Yi concept is like your life destiny, your human supreme um, fate. It's your karma. Yeah, it could be your karma. Like you're, you're, you're Not, just I mean, your, where you're going. Not, it's not the karma that like i don't know i i think sometimes when you say karma people think of that it's like a tit for tat that's not what i mean i mean your predetermined your desk your predetermined i mean that's why it's de- the literal word is destiny right but that that your predetermined path if you will is controlled by uh the the you know the the dow right like in this case the waste <laughs> Right. Well, that that inside your body, right? That mm. your um your prenatal chi, if you mm. will, and all that stuff, that's in your dandian. So, like the idea being that like you if you want to tap into that immortal, you know, whatever self you want to whatever you want to call it, you know, the thing that connects you to the Tao, that's where you do it. And so, you know, again, and and the the Zhong Ding Jing Chi Shen thing is the methodology to kind of to get you there, right? So, and the final thing is that the Dantian is the source of the E. So, like, even your mind, not your destiny, your mind and your energy are all somehow connected to this Dantian. This, the waste or the Dantian is this, it just, I guess, the bottom line to me is like the Dantian is everything that's well, where your study is going to take place all your action all your adventure like this is it's it. also it's also that there's a chicken and egg thing right that the Dantian is the source of the intent right it's where it all comes from but it's also where it all goes right it's like it the the implied in this is that you can affect it right that the tai chi is not a passive action right or it's not a passive thing you're actively going to be changing this karma your 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 fate right you're you're changing your body's fate that's kind of how i would think mm, maybe not yeah. your maybe not your you know you're not at unless you're real high levels you're not getting to the fate you know your your the fate of your spirit or whatever but you can get okay well what's the you know what's my body's fate right like how do i affect that well you can affect that from your dandian by moving everything in this controlled manner through these different layers of your body i mean again the bottom line is the same way that your dantian controls your physical movements so it also controls all the other it's the gateway to all the other types of training that can go on and to and yeah. you know fate itself could even be linked there so you, you that's pretty it deep. all the way yeah. <laughs> it's all the way all right. Well, it looks like this uh, the explana- the song of the 13 postures is going to have some pretty interesting stuff in it. I'm looking forward yeah, to yeah. seeing where it goes. Yeah, man. All right. All right. Talk Sounds to you good, soon. Man. Talk to you later. Hey, folks. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Uh, just a reminder, check out the Patreon for the extended episode as well as a bonus episode that comes out with along with every regular episode. Um, and as well on there, we've got interviews and more. So check it out. All right. Take care. Thanks for listening and be well.